Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, the show about the past, the present, and the future of democracy. Um, we've often asked in this show, in the three series that we've run, what is democracy? Uh, for the movie we made, uh, I went back to Athens, contemporary Athens, to dig about in antiquity to figure out uh, democracy. And we ended the show, or at least we began the end of the show or the beginning of the end of the show at the Berlin Wall. And we considered 1989 to be the beginnings of modern democracy. So in a very conventional Western scholarly way, we went from Plato, if not to NATO, Plato to the fall of the Berlin Wall as a potted history of democracy. But perhaps this is Western centric, perhaps it's rather parochial, perhaps it's not the right way to think about um, not only the history of democracy, but the future of democracy. My guest today on the show, I think, has written an important book on, um, on, on rethinking democracy, on thinking democracy outside uh, of just thinking about it in terms of uh, classical Greece and the fall of the Berlin Wall. His name is David Stasevage. He is the Dean of Social Sciences at New York University and the author of a wonderful new book, uh, The Decline and Rise of Democracy. David, am I being fair? Are you in the business of exploding mythologies about uh, democracy uh, and, and rethinking uh, uh, our relations with antiquity? I, I think you're being fair. I should say I'm not the first person to go in the direction I tried to go in in the book, but I wanted to give a comprehensive account to suggest that as important as the contributions of the Athenians and those who drafted Magna Carta and those in uh, Italian city-states of medi the medieval era were, that uh, the, the rise of democracy is not uniquely a, a, a Western tradition, that there have been a great many societies uh, on this planet over thousands of years that have practiced democracy in one form or another. They didn't necessarily do it with elections or with political parties or with the exact institutions that we think of as comprising modern democracy, but they had earlier forms of democracy where through one way or another, uh, a large fraction of people had the right to part and the ability to participate directly in, in governance. Da uh, David, what is it about the ancient Greeks that obsesses us? Is it our own narcissism? We see it as a mirror for ourselves. Um, Astra Taylor, one of our guests in our third series of the show, focusing on citizenship, who's politically on the left, also, like me, went back to Athens for her movie, What is Democracy? Uh, are we searching for ourselves? Well, I, I think there's always a risk that uh, we, we'd like to see ourselves as somehow different and somehow, somehow unique. Uh, and that's, that's the, that can be the negative side of, of overemphasizing the classical tradition. But I think with that said, the classical tradition is incredibly important because of the rich documentary record that we have and the, the extent uh, that a lot of that about the, 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 the work from Greek thinkers who thought about different forms of, of, of government and the way that these democratic experiments happened in Athens and other Greek, um, other Greek cities at the time were, were really incredibly important. And so I, I don't think we should devalue them at all, but I, I just think we should also recognize that other societies in much different places had not, not identical, certainly very different, but still forms of governance where people could participate in a council or an assembly. Uh, and that's a very important lesson for thinking about democracy and humanity more generally. Let's talk about that, David. You're not, as you said, the first person to be bringing this stuff up, but you do a wonderful job with it in your book. You focus in your book on the, on the Huron people uh, in particular, uh, and, and, and try to figure out what we can learn from them about indigenous traditions, uh, indigenous North American traditions of democracy. That's right. Uh, the Huron or the, the Wendat, as they, as they called themselves and still call themselves, we're, we, we, I focused on them because we have, by a stroke of luck, really, this incredibly rich documentary record uh, from the 17th century on the, on the Huron based on writings from Jesuit missionaries who went uh, to try to convert them, of course, and being good Jesuits, they 
wanted to learn a lot about this this civilization and so on. So there's a cre incredible amount of documentary evidence on how these people how these people govern themselves, and it, it's really quite a remarkable system that they had. When you think of the fact that they had uh, councils at the level of a village where most men would participate and where uh, women would not have direct participation, but who had to have a lot of indirect participation through other means, that at the level of a tribe above the village, they would also similarly have a council and then they would have a confederation council that would have a council of several different tribes. So it's a, it's a remarkably sophisticated means of governance that they had covering uh, a significant area. Uh, and I think it's remarkable the degree of participation and certainly the degree of participation for women uh, in Huron affairs was much greater than was the degree of participation for women in Athenian politics, for example, where from everything that we've read and everything that we know it would appear that women were even at the lowest levels of governance were really quite thoroughly excluded from participating in Athenian politics. Uh, the traditional caveats when it comes to Greek quote unquote democracy are women and slaves. Did the Huron people have slaves? Not in the way we think of it. Uh, there would have been captives who would be integrated from, from other groups who could be captured. Uh, they, there was a lot of conflict uh, between the Huron and other groups, notably between the Huron and the, the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee as they, as they called themselves. So this was not a land where everybody was living at peace, uh, but they did not have a uh, chattel slavery of the sort that we, we would have found in other places at other times. Your book also suggests it wasn't just the Huron and the Iroquois uh, of North America, but also uh, the, the, the indigenous peoples of what we now call Latin or Central America. Uh, Cortez found this, Cortez of course, not being perhaps uh, uh, the best uh, model, I think, for colonial adventurism. Uh, what did Cortez find that squares with uh, with what you found with the the the, the people, the, the Huron and the Iroquois? Right. So uh, Cortez, of course, was far less interested than the Jesuits in writing down and learning intimately about uh, civilizations in, he in, just in murdered Mesoamerica. Them, right? He just murdered them. Exactly. Now, what we do have is a record from when Cortez first entered a territory called Tlaxcala, uh, which is um, still 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 has the name uh, in, in Mexico, not not too far from Mexico City. Uh, and the Tlaxcalans were had a very interesting form of government, uh, and it was one they were adjacent to the Aztec Empire. Uh, Aztec Empire had become increasingly autocratic over time, uh, and the Tlaxcalans had a uh, what Cortez saw in his own words as a form of governance that resembled that of Genoa or Venice in the medieval or early modern era, and that there was no one supreme individual, and that there was a council of um, by some guesses 150 to 200 individuals or maybe more uh, who, run the, who ran the place. And so it had a, a, a very Republican feel to it, which we would think of as being very surprising. And I don't suspect that he expected to find what he did find there, but, but uh, thankfully either he wrote it down in his letters back to Charles V and it's, a, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting comment. And there's a lot of, there's people and archeologists and anthropologists who have done further work on that, on that society that really back up quite strongly the idea that this was, an, uh, was a, a, a territory or a polity uh, that was not a, a monarchy, uh, it was not an autocracy, uh, that it functioned more like a republic and became to be called the Republic of Tlaxcala by some people. David, uh, in our first series, one of our guests was my old friend, Adrian Waldridge. He's a um, very distinguished British journalist. He works for The Economist as well as writer. He has a new book out, In Defense of Meritocracy. And uh, I thought of him when you brought up the issue of, of Venice. Uh, Waldridge believes that um, meritocracy is essential to self-government. And indeed, he uses the example of the breakup or the decline of Venice because of the decline of meritocracy. In terms of these indigenous tribes, were they meritocracies? Uh, who determined who would hold power? Who determined uh, success and authority in these social and political structures? Yeah, so let's let's come back to the 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 Iroquois and the Huron examples. Uh, it, it's very interesting in that they didn't have elections, and so we might think, well, 
how could you have a meritocracy without elections? But what they had was a system where chiefs would often come from a specific lineage. Uh, but just because they came from a specific lineage doesn't mean it was one specific person who inherited in the way that someone inherits, say, the British crown. Uh, chiefs were actually nominated by um, clan heads, and clan heads were women in, in these societies. And it was possible as a chief that once you were nominated, you were not chief for life. Uh, that was that was not the deal. That you could be you could be removed if things weren't going well. Uh, and we have examples from the that the Jesuits wrote about where. There were discussions about saying uh, perhaps we don't want to nominate this person because there would quote be too many broken heads, uh, in, meaning uh, too mm -hmm. much conflict, uh, or maybe remove them because there would be too many broken heads. And so, in a lot of early democracies, I'm coming back to the Huron and the Iroquois examples, but there was a feature of this where, as a chief, you had to continue to prove your medal. You weren't there in the way we often think of chiefs as being inheriting it from their father and being chief for life until until you die. David, in your book, uh, The Decline and Rise of Democracy, you come up with a, a, a theory of democracy, a civilizational theory. Um, you suggest that some civilizations, for one reason or another, embraced democracy, other, others didn't. Uh, you talk about the indigenous uh, tribes of North America as being sympathetic to democracy. But in your analysis in a chapter on the Middle East, you suggest that democracy died or didn't exist in the Middle East, how would you compare and contrast the typical Middle Eastern society with the indigenous tribes of North America? Well, in, in early, uh, in pre-Islamic Arabia, there would have been certain strong similarities between what one would have found among certain societies in North America, and that these governance was at a local level, small scale, uh, again, by, uh, by discussion, a lot of discussion, the people who were what you would call chiefs uh, often had very little power over everybody else. All power was through consultation and compromise and convincing people to do what you want. You didn't have an army with you or a bureaucracy or anything like that. And so there were forms of de governance in early pre-Islamic Arabia that had a, had, a, had a ring of democracy to them, just like in a lot of other uh, societies elsewhere. Uh, but what happened then is that that pattern of governance died out, uh, not as a result of Islam, because some of the uh, ideas in early Islam about the principle of shura, for example, talk about governing through consultation, but because of the conquest by Arab armies uh, led them to inherit a powerful bureaucratic autocracy uh, named the Sasanian dynasty. Uh, and what they a sense found was once they inherited the Sasanian bureaucracy, they just sort of got rid of the leaders and said, we're going to take your, your system as it is uh, for taxing people and raising money and waging war. Then the caliphs uh, no longer had much of a need to govern through consultation or govern through persuasion. Uh, because they had, they could have an army that they could finance by this by this uh, rich agricultural region that they had just conquered, and the taxes would be collected by a bureaucracy, and all the technologies for administering that had already been established by the Sasanians before them. So it's an example of democracy dying as a result of someone inheriting a state bureaucracy. This issue of the state and of a state bureaucracy and centralized power, I think, is central in your theory of democracy. In Adrian uh, Waldridge's new book, he, he warns us that the Chinese have been refining their model of meritocracy now for 3,000 years. And as we undermine ours, or in at least in his view, if we undermine ours, then the Chinese model will become increasingly successful and we will tilt cultural, political, economic power towards China. What is um, the place of China in your theory, in your narrative? Are they a model of democracy or is there a kind of meritocratic state order in some ways antithetical to the kind of uh, democracy that uh, you see uh, around the world in other places like uh, the indigenous tribes of North America? Yes, it's 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 it's, it's precisely it's a it's a meritocratic or it was at times a meritocratic uh, model that was completely different from the democratic model from the democratic tradition in the sense that you start off with from a very very early period of time a democrat sorry a bureaucratic state and then 
the several dynasties develop uh, this very sophisticated examination system that turns out to be a way to recruit and promote people by merit. Um, and as a result of that, you have a method of governing that in theory gets you the best people uh, and that doesn't rely on any of the democratic means that we might think of uh, in, in the West today. And so I think that the key thing about the Chinese model is we should recognize the, the, the success of it and we should recognize the, uh, I don't want to say perennial, but long enduring uh, uh, nature of it. And so when he speaks about 3000 years, that's, that's precisely about the right, the right uh, time length to, to, to attribute to it. I'm not sure entirely, David, though, what your theory of democracy is. If it's a kind of self-government, isn't bureaucracy a form of self-government? It is, can be a form of self-government if you have members of society, say in a legislature, who are actively controlling the bureaucracy and not letting the bureaucracy do just what it wants. And so that's where I think the question of sequencing is critical because if the bureaucracy comes first without traditions of self-government uh, or self-government as we would think of it in the West today, then the risk is that it'll be very hard to develop self-government through councils or assemblies or legislatures after that point. But if instead one starts with a strong tradition of governance through councils or assemblies or legislatures, one could hope to add a bureaucracy in after that uh, as happened in England, for example, and that you can hope that then a ruler and a parliament or an assembly or whatever it's called uh, could develop and organize the bureaucracy jointly. And so then that does become a method of self-government. It's just you're delegating the day-to-day -day tasks of government to people who are most expert in that. But th they ultimately are subject to political control and to democratic control. David, you brought up the issue of women uh, earlier. Um, and the issue of women when it comes to uh, political power and democracy in, in, in the indigenous tribes of North America. How do you see uh, the success of female power in indigenous societies in contrast with the way in which women were excluded from early models of Western democracy, even American democracy? Yeah, so what's, what's, what's interesting is that if you look at early societies, then the evidence we have seems to suggest that women had greater influence in small scale societies. And as soon as societies became larger, had bureaucracies, had autocratic rulers, that the, 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 the role of women tend to diminish. We actually know this uh, from myths in which the extent to which men or women are portrayed as more powerful or more determined of, of events that that's more likely to be the case in uh, for, for women uh, to, to be portrayed positively in that light in smaller scale um, early democracies opposed to larger uh, societies that developed in an autocratic direction. And so there's this odd feature that it would seem with initial forms of political development often uh, sometimes led to the exclusion of women in a way that then excluding them from participation that they had previously had. But then, of course, with, and then, of course, the long history of European political development is one of the exclusion of women until a very, very late date in the game. And then it's only in recent, uh, recent times that we get uh, increased uh, female participation in politics again. So it's almost as if there's this sort of U-shaped phenomenon where uh, female participation starts out in many societies fairly high, but then drops as, as they develop and then only rises again. Uh, in, 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 in more recent times. David, would it be fair to say that there's a, a polemical element to your book and your narrative about democracy, suggesting that we in the West shouldn't be as triumphant, as self-congratulatory uh, about the achievements of Western democracy? Is there anything to be proud of when it comes to the birth of modern democracies over the last 200 or 300 years in Western Europe and the United States? Oh, sure. I think there's a, there's a lot to be proud of and that this required a lot of ingenuity in terms of thinking about politics and how things should be constructed and what our institutions should look like. And so the, the story, the development of modern democracy is, is really quite a remarkable one uh, that we can, should continue to study as we always had. I think what I would suggest is that uh, there are other peoples and other societies who also developed ingenious forms of thinking about 
governing themselves democratically. And so we ought to also pay attention to them. We shouldn't only look at ourselves because ultimately our own uh, model of modern democracy is something that hasn't been around for all that long. If you think of early democracy as something that existed in many cases for thousands of years, that our own, our own institutions are very recent. And it's possible that they'll evolve over time. It's possible they'll need to evolve uh, in a way that would uh, lead to continued democratic success and renewal. Recently, we had on the show uh, the American politician, um, uh, Tom Malinowski, arguing that uh, America should take the lead in a conference about democratic renewal. We also had Ben Rhodes, uh, Barack Obama's former uh, foreign policy advisor on the show. He has a new book out, After the Fall, which sees uh, the future and possibilities of America, uh, of democracy around the world very much through American lenses, through the prism of American democracy. Do you think thinking like Rhodes and Malinowski is correct? Should countries around the world measure and temper their democratic advance through uh through through american democracy do people have much to learn from the model here we, we have to be realistic and recognize that the last few years ha have done a lot of damage not just to our democracy but to the impression that our democracy creates to people abroad in other democracies that haven't uh seen in many cases the same sort of backsliding that 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 that, that we have and so I think we'd have to be prudent about that. I think the American model is still useful to think about. Uh, it's probably useful to think about in terms of things that have worked and in terms of things that have not worked, like the excessive degree of polarization that we have. And so I think if if other people in a, in a country like Ghana, which is a democracy today, are looking at us, they'll probably see some things that they might like which would work more like in the US. And there's probably some things that they're very grateful that it doesn't work like in, in, in the US. Uh, so that I think I think we'd have to be tempered in our in a reaction to those sorts of ideas. Is temper a, a polite academic euphemism, David? I think that's a polite academic euphemism. Yeah. Can we have yeah, another think, word? Should we just I, I, should well, we just be it, a little bit more humble? Is that a better way of thinking we, about it? Perhaps we should do that. And I certainly I, it, it really depends upon how this thing would get organized. I think it's it's a good idea, but it it really it shouldn't be. I can't imagine anyone serious thinking about, say, doing this in the model that it might have been, say, in the Clinton era in the 90s, where the Berlin Wall had fallen, all these countries were determined democratic, the US was growing, and it seemed like this was a, a moment where we had much to tell everybody else. We, maybe we still have things to tell other, others, but maybe they have things to tell us too. David, in our third series of the show, focusing on citizenship, we've had a a number of discussions about the value of, of a civic education. You've done a lot of writing and thinking on this front too. Do we need to renew civic education, reinvest, focus on schools, universities, places like uh, NYU? I, I think we need to focus on schools, uh, basic schooling, teaching basic civic ed education in our primary and secondary schools in particular. Uh, I, if you go back to the early republic in the United States, that's a great example where uh, several decades after the founding, there was a distinct worry would people actually want to participate d democratically by voting, by, by, by instead of rebelling or engaging in things like the Whiskey Rebellion or Shays Rebellion. And there was a sense at the time that said, well, we need to educate these people. And so you some, saw birth of something called the common school movement and common school funds administered by a number of US states. I think that provide that movement provides a lot of lessons about maybe renewing civic education today. At the same time, there's a twist to that in that people need to remember if you're in renewing civic education, then that's gonna have its biggest effect on people who are in their teens or younger today, who are not yet participating politically by voting, who are gonna be participating politically by voting in maybe one or two decades. So if you think of some of the, 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 the problems of American democracy as being more urgent than that, uh, as not being able to wait one or two decades, then I think we have to, we have to recognize, yes, we need civic education, uh, but, that's going to be a long-term solution. That's not a short-term solution. Should it be a civic education in humility, teaching these kids that the history of democracy didn't begin with George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, but actually with the 
uh, with the with the Huron tribe or the Iroquois tribe? Well, I grew up uh, in a liberal community in Ithaca, New York, where we learned about the, the Iroquois and learned about their, their governance um, in elementary school. And I thought that was useful. I think there are other schools across this country where people learn that. And I think that would be an interesting thing to add in uh, to, 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 to the curriculum, uh, to certainly to pr provide a, a broader view on what democracy is. And that doesn't mean that as a result, as we do that, we take anything away from emphasizing the, the, you know, the Federalist Papers and the development of the Constitution and all the incredible uh, thinking that, that went into the design of our institutions, but just that there, there are other democracies as well, and we should recognize that. Where are you on the role of digital in terms of enriching and fixing 21st century democracy? I'm agnostic, but hopeful that, uh, that, that, that it can help out somehow. I think the, the, the views on this have swung very radically, of course. If you, if you were writing a book, as some people did, about democracy in the internet circa 2003, 2004, this was wonderful. This would allow people to communicate and be connected and to participate in a way that prior to that you couldn't. Basically, you could vote, but anywhere you wanted to participate politically, you'd have to get yourself to go there in person. And so it seemed like this, this created new opportunities. And then, of course, what we've seen with the development of big tech and what we've seen with the way in which uh, misinformation spreads uh, that no one today would write a book that was quite as uh, unambiguously hopeful uh, as some people uh, were when 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 they were thinking about that in the earlier in the earlier in this uh, earlier in this century. Uh, so, but I guess what I insist on th thinking about is that the the digital era is very very recent, uh, and that ultimately people might be thinking of ways in which there could be connections. Uh, some representatives say having virtual town halls, thinking about. Um, some of the uh, random citizen panels or things like that of the sort that Elen uh, Landemore writes that ultimately there do have to be some ways in which digital could connect us better because fundamentally, if you come back to the problem that in early democracies, it was largely a face-to-face -face affair. And so participation was very deep. And in our modern democracies, participation has often been very, very broad once you get uh, full enfranchisement, not just for free white males, but for African-Americans and women's as well. But even after that point, participation has often been episodic and that most people are active politically only when they vote. And that happens every few years. And they're not, they don't have a way of thinking, of feeling in connection and, and engaged with government other ways. David, I'm pleased you brought up Elaine Landemore. I know you're a big admirer of her book, a new book, Open Democracy, the Yale University professor. And she's a great fan of citizen assemblies, uh, which is a way of reinventing uh, the political practices of antiquity. Uh, do you agree with Landemore here? Or are there other, um, other models of open democracy that you prefer? I think it's something that uh, it, it, at this point, we are in need of uh, it, it creativity and experiments. And so I see, I see the, the, the randomly drawn so citizens assembly is a very interesting idea uh, to think about as a complement to, to what we've already had. I think the, the thing to remember, I suppose, is that in earlier times when uh, people perhaps for some bodies were chosen by lot, that it was often the case that that was for a brief amount of time and that ultimately the principle of election won out over principle of selection by lot. And part of it comes back to a, uh, the idea that we were talking about earlier about meritocracy and, and, and selecting by merit. And so there's a real tension there. Uh, Elen's, uh, her men, one of her mentors, Bernard Manin, wrote a, a, a fantastic book called The Principles of Representative Government that is all about the development of elections and how elections come with this feature of the principle of distinction uh, and that they were chosen deliberately as an alternative to, to lot. So it's, it's all very interesting to think about. So I guess what I'd say for the moment is yes, the experiments like this should be considered and we should be seeing what happens and comes out of these assemblies and what sort of decisions they make and what is feasible and possible. Finally, uh, David, you are an optimist. Your book is entitled The Decline and Rise of Democracy. Uh, the great student of democracy, uh, Larry Diamond was on our first series, worrying that the numbers of democracies appear to be in decline, at least since uh, 
uh, the, uh, the first decade of the 21st century. Why do you remain an optimist about the rise of democracy? I, I think it really depends upon what your expectation was circa 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, where there's this been tremendous expansion in the in the number of democracies worldwide to the point and 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 the, I, I, I think the way some people were writing and some people were thinking in, in at, at that moment was said, well, this is just the wave of the future for all societies and even China, as they grow richer, they'll become democratic. And so for if, if you were that uh, if that was your expectation, then I think, yes, you probably no longer is optimistic today. But I think that also means that you had an unreasonable expectation to start off with, because if you look throughout human history, there's always been a mix of autocracies and democracies. Neither form of governance has been dominant. And so if we're in a world today where, depending upon the measure you use by which political scientists to come up with their classification of democracy, something like half of the human population is governed uh, under a democracy, to me, uh, that's actually dramatic, pro dramatic progress and that's quite striking. Uh, so if you had a tempered opt expectation to start off with a more realistic expectation in 1989, then I don't think you'd be so disappointed and, and, uh, and, uh, and pessimistic today. Well, ever the realist, the cautiously realistic, David Stasavage, uh, the, the Dean of Social Sciences at New York University and the author of The Decline and Rise of Democracy, a wonderful book, a rich, realistic, down-to-earth book about both the past and present and future of democracy. Thank you so much for appearing on How to Fix Democracy. Um, and I'd love to have you back on the show in the not too distant future to talk about the same issues. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thank you for having me.